Welcome back to Alberta Primetime. Paperwork for new TV service at the Bowdoin Penitentiary has caught the public's eye. Should inmates have TVs? Plus, bulletproof clothing, hidden compartments inside the world of Alberta's drug dealers. With our Wednesday crime panel tonight, Chris Hay is executive director of the John Howard Society of Alberta. Rod Gregory is a criminal defense lawyer and from the Calgary Herald justice and social issues reporter Jason Van Rassel. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hi, hi Jennifer. Medium security penitentiary, Bowdoin, is requesting corporate bids for cable. Prison administrators say TV is an educational tool. Chris, many Albertans might be saying, you're in prison. No TV for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, fair enough. I, I think what I would ask the viewers, though, is to, uh, what we often, I think we make a mistake when we think about justice, and we often think with our hearts and not logically with our heads. So with our hearts, we might say, you know, if you've committed an offense against society, you've done something wrong, you should be punished for that. Mm -hmm. um, but logically, we know the criminological research for decades now, decades and decades, shows that if you keep someone as close to society as you possibly can, whether they're incarcerated or not, but if they're incarcerated, if you keep them as close to society as you can, um, the easier the reintegration back to society can be. And the more you remove things that occur naturally in society, um, the more you prevent things from happening in prison, the more you restrict freedoms, the more you do these types of activities, the more you're going to uh, create an individual who might actually come out. I, Correctional Service of Canada themselves, there's a document that I read and they indicate that they believe some of their clients might be leaving their facilities worse than when they came in. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that we don't necessarily think about it in terms of TV, but we think about it in terms of trying to maintain um, a semblance of some sort of life while they are uh, uh, paying for their offense. And we should mention that they are paying for it themselves through their wages. Rod, is it a matter, I mean, there's the enlightenment side and psychology, but then there's rights or just rules. Is this something that we can control or does the charter or some other piece of legislation say they have a right to TV? I, I don't think there's a right under the charter for TV. There's the <laughs> right to be protected against cruel and unusual punishment. I don't think a judge is going to say that the loss of a TV is going to uh, withstand charter scrutiny. Most people who go into prison, they get a, a, a list of what things that they can take into the prison. Hmm. Most of my clients, when they have that list, aren't all fired up and happy that they get to take a TV into jail. They're expecting they're, it? They're, well, they're going to jail and they're you know, they're not happy about it and they understand that the li their liberty is being taken away. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, um, I don't think it's that large of an issue in terms of, of a prisoner and rehabilitation. It's more, I think, something that Albertans as outsiders wonder about. Uh, we have most mm -hmm. of us no idea what the inside of a prison cell is like. Jason, uh, how are prison administrators in Bowdoin defending this uh, request for proposals from cable companies? Because there's pros and cons. Uh, some say, well, they're watching TV all night and not making it to their work duty on time in the morning. On the other hand, guards perhaps say uh, they're much easier to handle when they've got TV. It's true. It, it, it does seem to be, I, I've heard that from correctional officers, that it can be somewhat of a civilizing influence. And it, it, it has been taken away from time to time. So it can bring a prisoner back in line if you threaten to take away their, t their TV privileges. As far as how administration defends it, Chris articulated it pretty well. I mean, and that is that, that keeping uh, offenders in touch with society and connected to society in some way, while still very much being locked up, helps aid their rehabilitation. Because let's remember, of course, that our prison system isn't there only to punish, it's there to rehabilitate. And, and you know, I, I have to say out of my own personal observation is that you know, a lot of the people that seem to, to like to criticize the prison system and, and make these kind of comments about club fed and about it being cushy tend to be people who have never been on the inside of a prison. You know, I've, I've been in enough prisons over the years, federal institutions, I've lost count how many times actually for parole hearings and I can tell you they are not pleasant places. So if they've got TV, it's not like they're sitting back eat, eating popcorn and, uh, and enjoying themselves. It's just one creature comfort really in, in what is a hard existence. Maybe it's gangs and personal safety that's a bigger issue at Bowdoin. Inmates asking to go elsewhere so they don't have to be a part of that. Is that happening at all, Chris? Oh, uh, I'm sure, um, but I, I completely agree. It's, it's, uh, 
I think, I think we have a misperception uh, about what prison life is actually like. Let me um, switch topics for a moment mm -hmm. before we go to commercial. Uh, three men and a boy accused of killing a wild pregnant mare near Sundry are now suing the RCMP for millions of dollars for malicious prosecution and negligent investigation. All charges were dropped when new evidence, photos I believe, showed the four had nothing to do with the mayor's death. She'd actually fallen off a cliff. Rod, another black eye for Mounties. Do plaintiffs have a case here? Mounties were using jailhouse informants in the beginning to build their case. Where's this one going? I, I think that's the more interesting issue. The Supreme Court of Canada has expanded the rights of somebody to sue for malicious prosecution, but it's still very, very difficult to prove. And this case, I think, has more to do with the defense having possession of that evidence, which they disclosed to the prosecutor, resulting in the charges being dropped. The more interesting thing about this case, I think, is the continued use of police agencies to rely upon who I call jailhouse informants, which is basically what these two guys were, drug addicts who were disgruntled from the accused, who wanted the reward, who were making calls about the reward, and maybe the RCMP putting blinders on um, just to get an arrest. Jason, could the Mounties sue, uh, pardon me, settle out of court to avoid public scrutiny, embarrassment? Well, only the RCMP can really answer that question for sure. Uh, Rod's raised a good point. These, these types of prosecutions and, and cases are, are, are hard to prove. I mean, bear in mind that uh, the police have to be able to operate in an environment where they can do their jobs, and unfortunately, uh, from time to time, they are wrong. But if the allegations in this lawsuit are true, I mean, they really are quite damning. Reading through the statement of claim, uh, one of the allegations is that the investigators didn't even uh, speak with the plaintiffs about this find of the horse on the road before going and arresting them. And that, that just to me right there is a huge red flag. They were just seemingly, allegedly, solely relying on, on this information coming from these, these jailhouse informants who were allegedly after reward money. Chris, do we sometimes see, uh, not in this case necessarily, but generally, uh, there are certain people, perhaps your clients at the John Howard Society, who always seem to lose when it comes to dealing with law enforcement, the deck stacked against them for various reasons? Oh, sh sure. I, I think a couple points, though. I, on one side of the coin, I, I used to work for a law enforcement agency prior to my involvement with the John Howard Society. So I do know that there are a lot of things that people will never have the privilege of knowing or understanding because that's just classified information or whatever the case may be. And so, you know, I don't really know this case specifically, but I kind of I, I hesitate a bit because on one side, I recognize that um, the police are often scrutinized, um, but often they're not actually wrong, um, but it can never really be said. Um, they're almost an organization that is, has to be a little bit higher um, than the rest. With that said, however, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, our justice system really marginalize, marginalizes a lot of groups of people, whether that be the poor, mentally ill, aboriginal, whatever the case may be. And so we do always have to be careful um, you know, from a sociological conflict theory perspective that we're not um, actually making marginalizing people or making things worse, for sure. But it's a difficult, um, it's, it's difficult to actually put your finger on, for sure. Next up, a $2 million cocaine bust in Alberta reveals hidden compartments in cars. The flak jacket business is also booming for companies inside that world when the Wednesday Crime Panel returns here on Alberta Primetime. Welcome back to Alberta Primetime. Hidden drug compartments in cars activated with hydraulics by a drug dealing driver. Programmed cues. Put it in neutral, tap on the brakes, hit defrost, the drug compartment opens. It's a sophisticated world out there in Alberta right now. Chris, um, we want to talk to you a little bit about body armor because you know you deal in Latin America with your company. Mm -hmm. Jason, let me first get to you though. The hidden compartments are a bit of a problem for Alberta police because there's nothing uh, on the books that they can lay a charge with, yet it's evident that these compartments in vehicles are pretty common and being used by drug dealers. 
It pops up pretty regularly in gang and organized crime investigations. We've seen uh, criminals using uh, hidden compartments underneath the hood, sometimes in wheel wells, sometimes just you know behind uh, behind the dashboard to conceal weapons and and or drugs. I wouldn't say it's common, maybe too strong a word, but it's certainly not unusual. So, Rod, the problem is it's a nuisance for police, drug and gang units. Uh, Premier Redford, when she was Justice Minister, announced a crackdown on this kind of thing along with body armor. No legislation. Is the problem that, well, how do you outlaw hidden compartment? How do you outlaw body armor if all the drug dealers are using it? Well, so are hunters. It's not illegal. I. I don't think making hidden compartments illegal is going to change anything for the police. I think Jason's right that when the police make a bust, um, they are they're entitled to search the vehicle. And when these hidden compart when they find the hidden compartments and there's drugs or guns, um, those things are going to be seized and and used as part of the chain of evidence. If that person's convicted. That's going to be an aggravating factor in the sentencing uh, judge's eyes, and that person could get a substantially greater sentence than someone else might other get, otherwise get because it shows the commercial nature of an operation. So I'm not sure provincial legislation outlawing, outlawing a compartment is going to change the way police do anything um, or the effect it's going to have with respect to judges and sentencing. Chris, is it, um, is it something that frustrates police? I mean, you were an officer at one time. Can you talk just about it shouldn't be allowed. We, we, it might not be able to uh, be on the books in some way, but it, it's an aggravation. Oh, for sure. And, and, and uh, as you said earlier, um, I work down in Latin America and South America and so on and so forth. Um, it, it, there is really... Uh, uh, it's a bigger deal down there, um, just Especially because the body well, armor. Well, and the body armor for sure. I mean, the organized crime down there is a lot more significant than we'll probably ever see in Canada, um, and their homicide rates and so on and so forth as a result of their gang activity and drugs and gun smuggling and that type of thing. So, it is. Um, I, I wouldn't like to say it's just a nuisance in Canada, and it's very serious down there. I think it's serious regardless, however you want to, however you want to look at it. I think it's serious um, anywhere. Um, but I, I think if I can make one point, um, uh, it's been told to me that the companies that are uh, making the body armor and so on and so forth are selling into the billions of dollars now to private citizens for their own personal safety. And that concerns me. Um, from a moral panic perspective, um, you look at Edmonton's homicides even last year. I mean, their, their loved ones and their gang members, uh, you know, the people aren't walking down the street in the middle of downtown Edmonton and getting killed randomly. It just doesn't happen. So. Uh, I know that it would be uh, a nuisance at the least and, and probably even worrisome to police um, that this activity is happening and it might be growing in Canada, um, but we're not to the point certainly that private citizens have to um, start arming themselves and wearing body armor and so on and so forth, which these companies are selling to. Jason, you talked about the compartments off the top, uh, so sophisticated that you know you have to get a, a mechanic in there to figure out how the dealer was operating the compartment in the car. What about um, body armor, mid to high level drug dealers? Is that standard fare for them? It certainly was uh, when the gang violence here in Calgary had really escalated between uh, the FOB and FK gang uh, between 2002 and 2008. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for police to stop these guys and they were wearing body under, un, under their clothes. And, and Chris has made a good point. Uh, it's one thing to market body armor to private citizens in a place like uh, South America where random violence and, and uh, kidnapping is a problem. Here in, here in North America, or at least in Canada, it, when the stuff does turn up among civilians, it usually is among the criminal element. And when we get these big busts, um, like the one in Edmonton days ago, uh, we're looking at uh, about eight years 10 years, sometimes double digits, Rod. It's not the revolving door that we might have Oh, heard no, about. not for large drug seizures. Um, it's not Serious uncommon time. to see uh, sentences in the double digits and 14, 15 years for very, very serious narcotics charges. So there's definitely not a revolving door At in Alberta. Level. And the, the Court of Appeal says that the starting point is three years imprisonment. So there, there's no revolving door, um, in my opinion. At that level. 
Thank you for your insights tonight. Chris Hay is executive director of the John Howard Society, criminal defense lawyer Rod Gregory in tonight as well, and from the Calgary Herald, justice and social issues reporter Jason Van Russell.